Good afternoon, uh, Rhys and Aaron. Um, as ever, it's a pleasure to have you here uh, at Archeo Soup Towers. Now, this afternoon we're making a video about um, indigenous issues in archaeology, and this is a topic which I find fascinating because, in many ways, Britain doesn't have a defined indigenous population. Now, there are many people who would argue against that for political reasons, other people would argue against that for um, pseudo-archaeological reasons, but ultimately there's no one right now you can point to as a culture in Britain and say, you know, those are the people who who culturally understand and built, say, the landscape around Stonehenge. Whereas you guys, in both uh, the US and Australia, you come up, come up against um, extant, ongoing, current cultures who, who demonstrably had links with the historical landscape about you. Um, and it's just interesting to, I suppose, to, to think about how you manage these issues. So I suppose, first of all, Reese. I mean, this first came up in our conversations, um, for me, when you were talking about actually Aboriginal archaeology and some of the, some of the, the, uh, the challenges which are inherent in that. So could you just open this discussion up? Certainly. Um, well, where to begin? There's challenges all over the place. Um, not all specific to archaeology, but I'll try to stick as stringently as possible. Um, the first um, point I would make is that Indigenous people are in some ways uh, involved to, a, to an extent with their own cultural um, heritage. The issue being is that they don't get to decide necessarily how they're involved and to what extent they're involved. Um, this also leads to issues with um, archaeologists where you will have uh, what we call in Australia, uh, well, Victoria um, is a RAP or a registered Aboriginal party. Now, a registered Aboriginal party down here is um, what would translate to as a tribe or a tribal area, traditional tribal area. And um, these RAPs um, have to prove descendancy to the Victorian government to um, basically be qualified as a RAP. It's, it's far more complex than that, but um, the issues being is that this works into uh, land title, conservation, and um, it, there are, are always ongoing issues with um, claims, basically, of Indigenous sites. Um, where do the boundaries lie? Where have they lain in the past? And um, that's certainly something that I feel needs to be looked at in a, in a deeper way. Okay. Um, I mean, Again, another reason why, why I find this fascinating is this concept of boundaries. I mean, my understanding is that many um, indigenous populations, especially, for example, in the north of, of America, so going up into Alaska and Canada, um, didn't have that sort of concept of ownership. And, uh, I mean, maybe um, Aaron might know a little bit more about this, but how, how do you negotiate um, ownership and explain, I suppose, the role of, say, archaeologists in curating this historical landscape when some people just don't want to have lines on a map. Well, what, what, what do you think, Aaron? Well, I would agree that um, at least the Native American um, different tribes around here, they really don't believe in, in boundaries per se. Now, it, it fluctuates depending on the tribe you're talking to. Um, there are some tribes that basically they'll take any kind of uh, whether it's just the, the landscape or the material culture that's found, regardless if it's necessarily their tribe or not, the way their, their spirituality is and everything, they will take on any kind. So it's a very, yeah, you're right about that boundary. They really don't have it. Hmm. Where there's other tribes that will be very passionate about their, their history, very passionate about their ancestry, and pay, tend to pay more attention to that ancestry itself. Right, okay. And that, is that ancestry which is tied to the landscape then? A lot of it, yeah, around right. there, uh, the landscape, uh, the, I guess it could also depend on what's found. Mm. Um, there's been issues going on before um, where tribes have kind of melded together. So like here in Kansas, we had the, the Kansas tribe, mm -hmm. the state is named after, but now they're the Kaw and down in Oklahoma. So, but they still have that ancestry, so they still pay very much attention to anything that would be found in Kansas that could be considered a Kansas site. Right, okay. Interesting, interesting. Um, well, in, in, I suppose the inevitable question then is, is 
is this good for archaeology? Um, and indeed, is archaeology necessary in these circumstances? Uh, I once read a, a very, very good book um, uh, by a, a guy called Bob Layton, who said something along the lines of, I think the title of the book was something along the lines of, uh, Who Needs Archaeology? Or, or more to the point, I think it was, Who Needs the Past? And he was taking an anthrop anthropological perspective on these things and essentially saying, well, actually, many groups don't require an archaeological description of their heritage. They have it already in their culture. All you're doing is coming in and giving them, a, as far as they're concerned, an inaccurate pastiche impression of what they have as a very strong sense of, of their own history. Um, this must cause conflict. This must cause friction. I mean, we'll just go back to Reese. Uh, starting again with you. Uh, what's your experience of this, broadly speaking, Reese? Um, well, to be blunt, it's true. Um, indigenous uh, culture in Australia is something that is not a singular. Um, it's, it's not a single tribe. Um, even though we have a, well, the indigenous people here have a national flag. Um, that some people might be familiar with, but the, po the point of it is, is um, we're starting to see things today as um, indigenous heritage um, being controlled in a way as a, as a national um, scheme rather than on a local uh, level where we're getting the idea that um, that some people are having their um, rights basically stomped on for the greater good. Mm -hmm. um, the greater good being? Uh, basically protection and um, what I would say is a very left-wing agenda of um, complete uh, protection mm -hmm. um, of these sites. Now, um, there are a lot of problems in Australia, especially concerning mining in the Northern Territory and Indigenous cultures. Now, the Northern Territory has a huge, well, not huge, but has a, the largest population of Indigenous people in Australia, and these cultures are still um, relatively well intact. Um, so sending an archaeologist in there to explain to them 10,000 years ago that their tool tradition changed is probably not something that they consider um, necessarily important. And I, I mean, um, I, I can't speculate on every individual and every tribal area because everyone will think something different. And of course, all the interreactions inter are different. So um, I honestly do think that uh, it's a very, very complicated issue um, to tell somebody else how they need to maybe perceive their heritage, um, perhaps tell them that, well, there was another group of people with a different tool tradition here um, thousands of years before your people were here. <laughs> those, kind of, those kind of arguments are extraordinarily dangerous to make. Um, archaeologists it seems, um, will not make those arguments, especially if um, it's a, um, a cultural heritage management firm. They would never suggest something like that because mm. of how much trouble it would cause. Yeah. Um, and I suppose this, this, this is something which, which we can relate to here in Britain, actually, and that is the relationship between uh, the past as, a, I suppose, a physically identifiable uh, truth which of course requires interpretation anyway, and the past as an identifiable thing, as something which people hold on to for, the, for their identity. Certainly that caught, there's lots of friction that, that surrounds that. I mean, I've uh, talked about this, say, for example, linked with, with Hadrian's Wall recently. But uh, I suppose just coming back to Aaron, uh, do you um, have, any exp uh, have any understanding of, of where these two different interests uh, come, uh, come, come to loggerheads? I guess over here, and I don't know how it is in Australia with, uh, with Reese, maybe he can shed some light for me too, because I'm, I'm not sure how it works there, but here in the United States, with the migration that a lot of anthropologists and archaeologists are trying to find the migrating of how the, the Native Americans eventually came over, a lot of the Native Americans don't believe in that that theory. They mm. have a different, they're not necessarily refuting it and saying that it doesn't exist, but to them, their beliefs are they came from the earth, they were here. So regardless of what you find in what level, they said it is still our ancestors. This is where we came from. We never migrated. So mm -hmm. that that's kind of different, difficult to sit there and say, well, you know, the Clovis were here before you. And they'll be like, that was us. They don't differentiate mm -hmm. the differences mm -hmm. because of their religious beliefs. 
<clears throat> as far as between anthropology and archaeology, archaeologists, uh, Native Americans, because of our history, um, most of the time it's pretty tense. I mean, I mean, obviously, without doing the stereotypes, I mean, we're white men. We're the white men. They, they, they still have that distrust of us. And for us to come in there as archaeologists or anthropologists and say, we want to study your remains, maybe even with some tribes, especially the smaller tribes like uh, the Omaha tribe that almost got decimated. Mm -hmm. We could study those remains and give you a little bit of your history back, and then you know the bones could be reinterred if, if they needed to be elsewhere. Some of them don't have any problems with that. Matter of fact, they they welcome it. Mm. But then you got like Lakota Sioux, um, where they'll sit there and they say, "This is our ancestors. These are our artifacts. We'll do with them as we wish." And if someone tries to tell them, and this is not all of them, I'm just saying this from general, from what I understand, if they try to tell them to, you know, well, you know, we've measured this skull and this is, may not be Lakota Sioux, they say, what gives you the right to tell us who these are? We know our people, we know our heritage, you don't. Mm. What gives you the right to act, I guess, superior to them? Yeah. So yeah, it depends on the tribe that you run into. Um, and then, you know, uh, like an example, um, and I have a link I could send you if you want to look at it. Uh, San Francisco in April, just recently, they found, I think it's a Makawa tribe uh, that was on the coast, and archaeologists found it, uh, over 600 barrels, I believe, and all kinds of artifacts. You can find all kinds of information. Right then, the uh, Native American Heritage of California swooped in and said, hold on, you're not supposed to be messing around with this stuff, this is ours. They pretty much took everything before the archaeologists could look at it and went to an undisclosed location and reburied everything properly to their traditions. And the archaeologists, of course, were upset because they took it, and that has caused a lot of friction there in California because of it. Right, right. Yeah, um, and this is, I suppose this is exactly what I um, was was slightly, for want of a better word, concerned and aware of might be the case. Uh, this, this, this friction, I suppose, between extant identities and how um we all are using and interpreting the past um is there a, is there a way forward i mean for example is it right to say that the so-called objective perspective of, of an archaeologist um although it has its roots in basically a western scientific philosophy uh is the best way to again blankly look at the past or actually should should archaeologists be far more aware and far more happy actually frankly very happy to let people take control of what they perceive as their own identities now this is this is this is a very difficult question so um uh, okay, again we'll just take our turn so we'll go back to reese on that one well yeah um i suppose it all comes down to who owns the past. I mean, it's it's one of the first chapters you read in most stuff uh, from archaeology textbooks these days. Mm -hmm. And there is no definitive answer to this. Absolutely none. And um, I find that it's a moral issue that every archaeologist, um, well, from where I'm from, has to deal with at one stage or another. Um, I think all we can do, all we can do is try to be respectful of the people who, as you say, perceive this to be their heritage and to work with them as closely as possible and foster relations with them. Um, the other issue is is that um, at, at this point, archaeologists and anthropologists have a bad name in a lot of um, Indigenous uh, areas across the world because of the treatment over the past hundred years, mm -hmm. for example. Um, uh, well, for example, think, collecting um, native heads from Australia and putting them on shelves in museums in New Europe. Zealand, yeah, and, mm. and fostering this belief of, um, I suppose, imperial dominance over these people. Um, mm. And it, it's very difficult to, um, I suppose, repair that relationship, but, but we are trying. Um, mm. All over where you're trying. Hmm. Well, I, c I can see Aaron nodding his head a lot there. So rather rather than risk a, a simple repetition of the of the the, uh, the ideas and the, um, uh, the, the the hopes that Reese has just mentioned, um, I suppose I'd like to, at this juncture just to bring up um, <laughs> uh, Arthur Pendragon. 
um, the, the 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 bloke in Britain who uh, is is the is the proclaimed king of the druids who claims that, for example, Stonehenge is a is a, an ancient monument linked with his people, and he has an understanding of, for example, the the guardian role that the people buried around that monument had, and essentially he's claiming, and indeed the group around him are claiming a, a, an identity link, but also a, an interpretive um, ownership of the site. How, what, is that essentially, that, is that the line? Is that where it's gone too far? Because, because this is, this is a very modern phenomenon. This isn't, a, there's no consistent, constant culture there. This is someone claiming it. That said though, aren't all monuments claimed over time by different people? I mean, what, what do you think, Aaron? Um, where should we draw, draw the line? See, now I guess that's a tough question because, I mean, I, I just recently heard about that. So, um, I don't know. I mean, from my experiences over in the U.S. too, with with new claims, whether it's it's Native American sites or even mass graves of uh, settlers heading west. I mean, there's different groups like uh, you know the Mormons out in Utah. They have sites too. I mean, it, it's just I think I don't know where you would draw the line necessarily. Like I guess that's is a very you have to do it by, a by basis determination. But I don't see why, if they legitimately think that, why they couldn't assist in a way i guess not necessarily say this is well you know you think this is yours that's great but there are other cultures and stuff that used it as well i don't see why you could bring in a group to work and just basically i would look at it as if you just look at stonehenge from just one angle it's kind of black and white bringing all these different groups in would just make it more that more vibrant and that more interesting mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well i suppose the word there is pluralism uh, and being open to the fact that, that other people will have other interpretations and not all of them have to be uh, diametrically opposed to the one which is put forward by archaeology. Um, I mean, uh, this recently came up, and I, I was recording it in a podcast um, with the uh, the An Archaeologist podcast folks. Take a look at it. Um, we're, we're, we're talking about pluralism, and um, and for me, and I get I get I get quite angry actually about about Druids and Stonehenge because for me this is partly because actually I, I'm again I love the, the tradition of, of Druids I mean the, the, the modern cycle of Druidism has its place in the in the modern world it, it does for example the nice nationalized death rod in uh, in Wales they play a key role in in proceedings there I've been to the nationalized death rod it's a it's a very worthwhile event but I suppose for me the line always has to come down to whether or not the narrative that someone is putting forward can be demonstrated in any way other than it being simply i i feel i feel that i am linked with this land or that i am linked with this monument and it doesn't necessarily have to be a scientific proof or a positivistic proof you know, can't always prove for example um often identity is based on a negative you know we're not them so you can't prove that negative but i suppose when people when it's, it's fairly clear that people are, are simply romanticizing the past and claiming something which um, gives them a sense of who they are. Perhaps we need to work, as you say, work with them, but also maybe encourage them to find that sense of who they are in something a little bit more, dare I say, real. Now, this doesn't apply to, for example, native populations in the US and, and Australia, certainly not in all cases, you know, um, absolute, absolutely not. But in the instance where, I mean, for example, I know in the past Reese has said that he, you're downright offended by uh, King Arthur Pendragon claiming to be an Aboriginal of Britain. You know, it, it, it's a term which can be used and abused against a, a positive way forward, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, I wasn't so much personally as a offended by this as I was affronted um, for the people who have been fighting for so long to get recognition over sites. Um, for example, the Pilbara. Um, so mining companies just can't waltz in there these days and take uh, things like uranium and iron ore without consulting the indigenous populations these days. And certainly they get, they get bullied these days into taking contracts and things in some cases. Mm. And then you've got this... Um, person over in the UK who is suggesting he has some entitlement that um, is reminiscent of this. And I think that's disgusting. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it leaves a bad taste in the mouth. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, it, it, I suppose what my, my, I remember talking about this with you actually, and my, my response was, well, okay, if you understand this monument so well, tell us about it, explain and fill in all the gaps and then 
we'll, we'll work with you. But, but ultimately, as I've also said in the past, Stonehenge is just one altar in a massive church landscape, as it were. It's like going to a cathedral, looking at one chapel and going, oh yes, I understand the whole building. Um, people fixate on that one thing, and in this case, Mr. Pendragon is as well. And uh, it's a shame that, that, that we can't... I suppose as Aaron was saying, that we can't work... Oh, that we, no, so not can't, but we haven't so far worked more productively to encourage and foster a more nuanced understanding of the past. Uh, and who knows, maybe groups like King Arthur Pendragon and his druids might uh, actually benefit from working with archaeologists. I mean, um, yeah, uh, again, this, we're not talking about native population there, but we're talking about, about the use of and invoking this native population, the rights of the native population. And um, I don't know, um, uh, assuming that, that we all agree that, that, that working with native groups is a good idea, is there anything that, that you, you guys would like to say, I suppose, to round off this video? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree. I know there are certain state archaeologists here in the United States that are trying to bridge that gap. Some have done it very successfully, where the natives are willing to work with the state uh, government archaeologists to try to protect their sites. Not only just protect them, but, um, you know, preserve them, find out information about their ancestry if they desire. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still a lot of, I mean, I don't want to say everybody, but I mean, there's just, there's just some elite, elitism, I guess, in that where the archaeologist is still kind of looking down on the native saying, well, this is what we need to do with this, 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 and this, and this, and so that's not helping the situation any. I think that they need to kind of do the uh, olive branch to the, the native people and sit there and say, this is what we would like to do, but how would you like us to handle it? Yeah. Just kind of try to get that open dialogue going. Yeah, so maybe come out of the ivory tower and hand over a magnifying glass or two, um, rather than just looking at the people themselves as well. Oh yes, you, you're native, are you? Oh, um, <laughs> I mean, uh, what, what do you think, Reese? Just to round this off. Um, I suppose my lesson of the week really is um, using anecdotal evidence to support a theory. Um, I believe indigenous people have um, just as much of a problem as using anecdotal evidence saying well as you were saying before um, this is how I feel this is how I interpret it ergo you have no right to um, say any different I don't think that's a productive way of working I certainly think that that applies to the case of the Druids and Arthur Pendragon um, using anecdotal evidence especially when there are new discoveries about Stonehenge as recent as the last couple of months that well, last couple of weeks the last mm. couple of weeks there you go but um no I, I think there needs to be a um, bigger posturing of cooperation um, on all levels uh, state local and federal uh, I also think that indigenous people need to come to terms with um, the changing cultural landscape uh, in, in modern aspects, I think, um, in that there is now uh, this world, this entire globalisation of the world that they live in and that their culture needs to, I suppose, fit into that world, um, the same as ours. Um, and we need to... We need to foster um, these cultures into our culture as well. We need to accept that these people are still here, that they have a living and breathing culture. And we must respect that um, just as much as um, anyone else. Hmm. So in, in that sense, just to, just to clarify, um, you're not making like the Borg argument, you know, we'll, we will add your distinctiveness to our own. Rather, as part of this globalised community, people need to accept that they need to work with it with, with a globalised community rather than against it. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about indigenous communities. Like there is a massive um, indigenous uh, forum that happens every year between um, people all over the world um, where they learn um, different ways about um, dealing with cultural heritage issues. I know Australian indigenous people um, and native um, Americans have learned things off each other. And this is what I'm talking about. I'm not saying that um, us as, um, uh, we use the term Europeans, are going to teach the indigenous cultures everything. That's not true at all. I'm, I'm talking about how they can um, basically develop archaeology themselves and take control of their own heritage um, via other indigenous groups and learning the lessons. And we then can learn these lessons as well. Mm, okay. 
Uh, that's very interesting. That's a really interesting place to end this discussion. So uh, thank you very much once again to you both uh, for your time. And uh, hopefully in the comment section below we'll have a lively and civil discussion. Um, so if you guys have any comments or thoughts, please do comment below. We will read them and we will reply. And uh, Reese and Aaron will both re uh, refrain from being too rude in response. So... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, no, seriously, this, this is a very interesting topic, and um, please do comment below. Uh, as ever, until next time, do take care. Bye-bye.